Let's face it, most people aren't making massive turkey feasts on the regular, and after 364 days of not thinking about it, it can be hard to get that bird just right. That's where Instacart, the holiday rescue app, comes in. From getting all the ingredients to prep a full seasonal spread to getting last-minute swamps in a turkey emergency, Instacart has everything a holiday host needs to save face and save dinner. And right now, if you download Instacart, you get free delivery on your first three orders and delivery in as fast as one hour. Offer valid for a limited time. $10 minimum per order. Additional terms apply. Well, well, well. Shopping for a car? Yep. Carvana made financing a car as smooth as can be. Oh, yeah? I got pre-qualified instantly and had real terms personalized just for me. Hmm. Doesn't get much smoother than that. Well, I got to browse thousands of car options on Carvana, all within my budget. Doesn't get much smoother than that. It does. I actually wanted a car that seemed out of my range, but I was able to add a cosigner and found my dream car. It doesn't get much... Oh, it gets smoother. It's getting delivered tomorrow. Visit Carvana.com or download the app to get pre-qualified today. Joining me on the podcast today, I like to call him the uh, the people's champ of the MFFLs throughout the course of the year. He has done a terrific job covering the Dallas Mavericks and does so for DallasBasketball.com. Grant Afseth joining me here on the podcast. Grant, what's going on? Not much. Uh, looking forward to talking about the Mavs. Uh, there's not, not too much else going on in the uh, Mavs lane, for sure. <laughs> I appreciate you taking the time with me. Yeah, I think for a lot of Mavs fans, um, a disappointing year, obviously. We're so used to seeing this team, at least over the last few years, be in the playoffs and them not, not only make the playoffs, not only not make the playoffs, but not make the play-in at all either. Uh, and what was a disappointing year. If you had to describe, Grant, the the Mavs season in one word, what word would you use to describe the Mavericks in that way? That's a good question. Um, I think I think uh, it's probably an easy one, but probably just disappointing. I think would probably just be the, the best way because, you know, after making uh, the trade for Kyrie, uh, there was like, you know, talk about, oh, we could be a contender, like title contender. And then you tank the last couple of games, like, I, or deflating, I should say. Deflating <laughs> is probably my word. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with deflating. Yeah, yeah. I think for a lot of Mavs fans, that would be the couple of words that they would choose. Disappointing, deflating, uh, weird would probably be another word that may come to mind. From your vantage point, what went wrong? I know there's a lot of things that did. You can talk about defensively, some of the things that didn't work from some of the free agent moves that they made with JaVel McGee and Christian Wood. But what for you, as you observe this team throughout the course of the year, felt like went wrong the most for this team? Yeah, I think um, a lot of it uh, probably had to do with um, like balancing uh, big picture uh, potential, like um, like, are we going to go through growing pains of trying something new, or are we just going to rely on what we're comfortable with from what worked last year? And then those things that worked last year, like the defensive approach, uh, lineups and things of that nature, they didn't actually work that fantastic. Um, so I think like even, uh, you know, like an, a- like apprehension to try new things and then, um, you know, going back to, uh, things that are comfortable, they weren't necessarily reliable. Um, whenever, you know, they did go back to those, uh, those kind of like comfort zones, if you will. And it was interesting watching this team as it went on some of the things that they tried to change schematically at times. I'm interested in your take on this because it felt like at least in the early portion of the year, teams were like, look, we're going to dare Luca to score 50 and try to wear him out and try to make these other guys beat them. Did you see some of that? Because obviously we'll get to Kyrie Irving, you know, during the second half of the year in a little bit. But in the early part of the year, did it feel like teams were just saying, look, look, go ahead and go get your 50. And if you beat us, great. But we'll see and take our chances with with you guys. Yeah, I definitely think that is how it was, you know, against teams like the Rockets and like even the Spurs and and those types of teams that are rebuilding, like even, you know, needing to kind of get to that extra gear uh, to get a win when in other situations, if you kind of had a more complete roster. Those should instead be games where he's not not even playing the fourth quarter um, as opposed to having to like get, you know, one or two gears higher to get the 50. Like that's uh, I think that's definitely a good way to kind of summarize the buildup of uh, like kind of kind of the exhaustion exhaustion or, you know, the fatigue that kind of became an issue later on in the year is when you need to rely on, um, you know, the 50 point game, 40 point <laughs> game, the third 30 point game right out of the gate for like eight, nine straight games you know like that has a aware aware that kind of builds up and that's why you know some of those older veterans you know, even like a Kyrie Irving like they pick their spots more um but then 
you know, that's part of the issue that, you know, we'll probably get into is you got to build a team where the guy can pick his spots um, and still be successful for sure. Yeah, of course, the culminating game that we saw from Luca this year, the 60-20 game that he had against the New York Knicks, still incredible to think about what he did that night and all the things that went into that particular game. But you started to touch on it with Kyrie Irving, this team obviously making the move at the trade deadline, moving on from Dorian Finney-Smith, Spencer Dinwiddie, sending them to Brooklyn and trading a first-round pick along with it, getting Kyrie Irving. When you look at how those two meshed on the floor together, when they had the time to be on the floor together, what did you see from the two of them that gives that should give Mavs fans the idea that these two in concert can really make some magic going into next year and beyond. Yeah, for sure. I think in general, um, you know, Kyrie has a lot of experience, like, you know, you can go back to LeBron and, uh, you know, Kevin Durant, um, you know, those types of guys playing with superstars, um, you know, like that, that kind of goes into the narrative aspect, but when you see it in practice, like he uh, picks his spots in the first quarter, sometimes, you know, you'll even uh, have it be a little bit too, uh, too passive uh, with him trying to adjust to a new team where, I think I remember in Indiana, um, even the Pacers broadcast was like, why is Kyrie Irving spending so much time in the corner? Like, I think, I think with the training camp um, the, in an early season kind of process that they did not get, you can kind of work in and install more things in the offense and have more familiarity. I just think that's um, like when you kind of drop Kyrie into a team midseason, something that he's never done before. I think there was more of a uh, like kind of desire to be like, all right, I'm an add on to what this team's doing. I think he's, he even said that a couple of times as opposed to like, all right, we're going to just like kind of take this apart and, you know, really rework this on the fly. I think it was more of like a, you know, this team was fourth when I got here. Um, like, let's I'm not going to be like demonstrative or destructive to what they're they're doing. I mean, obviously, it, it ended up being a thing where they didn't even make the play in. Uh, but like, I think that's kind of something that he uh, did alluded to a lot is like, you know, like I've never had this experience where I have not been in a training camp with the team that I finished the season with. Like a midseason trade is just new territory. But I do think like, you know, in principle, uh, you know, Luca's like the you know NBA's leading first uh, quarter scorer, uh, so he can kick things off. Vince Carter even kind of said that in an interview that he did, um, I think, with the Fort Worth Star Telegram, uh, just kind of that um, you know, like NBA Hall of Fame uh, or superstar, former star um, kind of perspective. Um, and then like Kyrie can kind of you know carry that second unit as he did uh, whenever Luca goes to the bench. And then you know just in the in late games, it's kind of a a feel situation where it's like, who's got the matchup? How are they playing us? Who can get an advantage? And I think that's the stuff that you just build with uh, experience uh, playing together. Um, like you, you can't really like manufacture feel or continuity. You kind of just have to go through it and uh, see like, Oh, okay, well he likes to do this when he's like, you know, backing down on like in the post, um, you know, Oh, he likes to, you know, get to this spot, all that stuff. Like that's, but you got to just kind of go through the, uh, the wins and losses and, uh, you know, those, those kind of experiences together to, to fully like kind of understand and appreciate. Did this team miss opportunities, Grant, in your mind with Luke and Kyrie as screeners for each other? We didn't see a lot of that from the two of them when they got together. Are there more opportunities for them to play off of each other that way? Luca may be playing a little more off ball, given what Kyrie can do offensively. What schematically do you think could change based on the way these two be, are able to build the kind of continuity that they should going into next year, if Kyrie is back, of course? Yeah, I think uh, I think they could utilize that a little more. I also think that, um, you know, Luca could have been utilized more um, off the ball uh, with Kyrie kind of initiating things. But that's also something that, you know, you uh, you kind of like as we just talked about, like like Kyrie has to know the offense at a high level, you know, he's got to like be super familiar with it. And, you know, I, I remember like, cause it was relatively similar circumstances with the mid season trade. Like I asked doc rivers um, before the Mavs played the Sixers, like basically like what was the biggest adjustment and how long did it take for uh, James Harden uh, to kind of get familiar with Philly. And he said, like, it's very hard to put the ball in the hands of someone who doesn't know what you're doing. And it took mm. until the summer, like midway through the summer where it fully like, like, like kind of like unlocked for, for Harden and he kind of fully understood what they were, you know, trying to do and, you know, the, the nuances of their offense. And then it made going into next season a lot easier with them having like the, the pick and roll chemistry with, with Joel Embiid, 
um, and things of that nature. Um, so I think uh, that's why it's kind of harder to necessarily say like, um, you know, they could have done a lot of, um, you know, like put Luca and off like, like pin downs and, you know, just different stuff. I think they could have done a little more of that, but that's also something that I would like to just kind of see how they approach it after the training camp and a little more time together when they're like installing the offense uh, from the start. Um, so that's why it's kind of hard to like necessarily fault too much with like schematics and all, because there's so much nuances that I feel like go into it that like, it's a lot easier for me just to say like, why, why did Jason Kidd not just like do more, <laughs> more of this action, that action, all that stuff. But like when you're in the, you know, the actual like game environment and all that stuff, it's a lot different. So like, I'll just be curious, you know, if they run it back, of course, uh, you know, with Kyrie's free agency, um, you know, like how that kind of looks as they have that time to kind of add layers and all that stuff to the, to the whole mix. And we'll touch on Kyrie a little bit more throughout the course of our time here, but you started to allude to something that I think was one of the more polarizing aspects of this season. And as someone that was covering this team on the ground, traveling and seeing this team on a night to night basis, a lot was made of Jason Kidd and the rotations at times that he used, some of the decision making, whether it be after timeout plays, lack of calling timeouts. Where do you stand with Jason Kidd when it comes to the success that he had in year one, taking this team to the Western Conference final to ultimately them not even making the play in? Where are you at with Jason Kidd when it comes to him being the coach of this team? Yeah, I definitely think like, um, you know, like the responding in the locker room uh, to the coach's voice, like that stuff that's really hard to kind of know, um, like unless you're, you know, one of the players involved or like, you know, really like kind of in like in the locker room in those situations. Um, so I, I think it's hard to necessarily like point to any of that aspect of the coaching, uh, you know, kind of like evaluation, uh, if you will. Uh, but I think like there are definitely some areas uh, that could be improved, like, uh, you know, something that just constantly – um kind of like you know sticks out when I just think about the season it's just that Milwaukee close game um that they had where you know the the Bucks clearly knew uh what the Mavericks were going to get into with a down screen before they did it Luca knew that they knew and was kind of <laughs> like like what like hello like uh are, is anyone home like on the coaching <laughs> staff like, like hello like anyone on the bench can we do something different please <laughs> yeah yeah like, like this is gonna look really really ugly if this oh and you know we lose and then he kind of had that like like he, he kind of showed his frustration at like half court like kind of like pumping his fist or you know what, whatever he did you know like he was definitely like dissatisfied or uh or you know whatever you want to call like like upset with that um, so things like that, like, like you, you know, it's, it's hard to be really, really like efficient in those situations. Cause it's such like high degree, of, di high degree of difficulty. The other team's really locked in on their details and all that stuff. So it's like, you know, like, it's kind of like game winners, like, uh, like with players, when you look back at percentages, like, like if you think about like the most clutch player, you know, their percentage is probably quite a bit lower in reality on like that, like game winning shot attempt, like Kobe Bryant's. LeBron's like like Michael Jordan even like it's probably lower than what you would like be like oh wow that's a little surprising if you really like look at it so I think it's kind of hard to like necessarily be like oh well you know they could have won like five to seven to ten more games just purely off of like you know if the end result uh would have like gone their way that's true but like also at least the approach could have been better because like the results you can live with as long as the approach uh, kind of gave you a better chance. There was too many like Luca 30 foot step back type shots that were kind of relied on in those situations that I felt like, you know, there, there's definitely some fine tuning. Um, you know, I think kind of with them, not to ramble too much, but with the experience, um, like kind of like pursuit to add to a, uh, to the coaching staff, like, mm -hmm. you know, someone who's got a head coaching experience, that's probably an area that, um, you know, you would hope that that, you know, is boosted or improved. Uh, with with a voice of that that kind for sure yeah there's been reports by mark stein who's covered the league course for a long time formerly the dallas morning news and now does his work with substack that former head coaches like james borrego with the charlotte hornets jeff hornacek long time coach in the league as well former player could be potential ads to the coaching staff for jason kidd as greg st Jean is reportedly not going to be back as part of the staff for Jason Kidd this upcoming season. Speaking of offense and polarizing individuals, we touched on Jason Kidd. 
Grant, I don't think there was any more polarizing player for the Dallas Mavericks this season than Christian Wood. And obviously, Christian Wood, who was traded on, you know, to the Mavericks on draft night, at times looked like a player offensively that Mavericks fans were like, hey, keep that dude on the floor. But other times you looked at and said for all the points that he scored on the offensive end, he gave it all back on the defensive end. Before we get specifically into Wood, why was he so polarizing for the Mavericks this year based on your observation and how you covered him and what you were able to see from him on a night-to-night basis? Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with, um, like, if you kind of take it from the start, they're a team coming off a Western Conference Finals appearance. So I think, like, from the start of the season, there's at least some benefit of the doubt that a lot of people have for a team of that kind where it's like, okay, well, I'm going to trust – you know, the winning culture, if you will, and like, you know, the lineups that they're going to pick, like those guys were with this team that made it that far. But I think the effectiveness, like, I don't think it was fully like kind of understood with some of the personnel, like starting, um, you know, like opening night, you can take an example, like Reggie Bullock, uh, Dorian and JaVale um, as the three through five with Spencer and Luca. Like, I think there was a, a thought, you know, like, okay, well, if we just have some someone who can, like, you know, block some shots, grab some rebounds, roll to the rim, and set screens for Luca and pick and roll, and then sp- other people space out, and then, you know, Spencer can, you know, do, do some off dribble, you know, attacking um, at times as well, we should be good. All we need is the, the bench to basically keep pace, you know, score some points, get some stops, um, and, you know, Christian Wood can be an integral part of that uh, as a sixth man. But I think part of the problem as the season went on is that, like, you kind of look at what the results were. They're not this great defensive team. And it's like, okay, so at what point does it make more sense to kind of go all in on, like, we're just going to score a ton of points um, and see what works and, you know, things of that nature. And I think the contract status kind of creates more of a pressure to kind of figure things out and try things as well. Like, when you're signing up for a guy who's in the final year of his deal, it's hard to kind of go through a full season where you don't try like, okay, well, would he be a good option for us as a starter? Uh, or is he best for a six man? Well, you try the six man role to start, but it's like injuries kind of required them to start him. That wasn't really like a, you know, we're going to set out to start him. Um, like I feel like that's kind of where there's a, a more of a, a controversy uh, or controversial aspect started to come into play is that they were kind of forced into starting him with the injuries. Like, I remember Tim McMahon, I think it was like either the week of or very like close leading up to it. He reported that it would be like unforeseen circumstances for Christian uh, Wood to start. And then injuries, <laughs> yeah, like, like yeah. the way the Mad season went, you know, like injuries, like not, not saying that's inaccurate, but it's like um, injuries happen, they piled up, and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, we are, like Christian Wood's going to start, and then, you know, you look at the win-loss record, all that stuff. You know, they played some, like, some bad teams. But, like, you know, 9-4 and four when Luka started with, uh, you know, Christian Wood. And, like, you know, that was a successful, like, general stretch for a team that had a losing record. And I think that's where it becomes a constant, a constant like, kind of argument where it's, like, um, you know, some people will look at, like, the, the you know, net ratings, the plus-minus. Others mm-hmm. will look at win-loss. But then it's, like, overall – it's like, what would, you know, what, what's necessarily the identity that even would be smart to establish that that could work and then build towards playoff success? Like, there's just so, there's just so much, like, <laughs> layers to it. And it's like, at the end of the day, they're a team that, like, didn't even make the play in. And it's like, arguing about some of these smaller details and all that stuff. It's like, it's, you know, it's kind of like, uh, at some point, let's just see what they do the off season. You know, like true. Uh, it's like, like at the end of the day, if if someone wins an argument and they don't even qualify for the plane, it's like you even it like, doesn't like, even like, matter. What's the, what, yeah, what, what's <laughs> what's the end end game there? You know, like it is what it is at that point. And we're definitely going to get into that because May 16th is coming right around the corner and Mavericks fans are sitting on pins and needles, hoping that they are able to keep this top 10 protected pick and hopefully not have to send it to New York. But for me, looking at this team throughout the course of the year, it felt like what they had in terms of my identity last year, defensive team, especially during the second half of the year last season, really good on that end. 
it just never came together for them defensively this season. Obviously, personnel changed quite a bit, inconsistency on that side of the floor. What did you see defensively from this team that changed so much aside from the personnel? I know they dealt with injuries. I was with Josh Green, Max Cleveland missed extended time, you know, with the hamstring injury. But what did you see defensively that changed or switched up so much that caused him to be so poor on that end? It felt like this past season. Yeah, I think if you even look at like kind of those uh, January uh, kind of parts of the schedule where, you know, they were starting, um, you know, Dwight Powell and then they had like uh, Dorian um, and Reggie Bullock. Um, th- there were some games where they put it together and it worked well. Like I think against the Miami Heat, they had a game where, you know, they were flying around. Um, you know, it kind of looked like that team that they were last year where, you know, like they, they made the initial closeout. Someone was in position with the, you know, the extra effort and then they closed the play. Um, but like, I think that's just a hard style to kind of sustain, like, like you're making all these extra efforts. And I think, uh, that takes a toll throughout a whole Western conference finals run. And then throughout a a regular season, like that's something that you can kind of get to. I feel like when you're switching the style up within a game, like, you know, like golden state can go to Draymond at the five and it's extremely effective whenever they do it. Um, because you know, you have to change your principles, um, and that gives them some versatility. But it, there's a reason why Draymond isn't always at the five, and it takes a physical toll uh, to kind of start the game and do that over and over and over again throughout a game and then play a full season. And I think that's just kind of something that happened uh, with them is that it's just hard to replicate that style. And then they – I don't think the wing defense was as you know impactful on the ball this season. I think uh, you know being uh, less effective containing that initial penetration – that's a very hard style to even harder, I should say, when you're like having to then make all those extra efforts even more because that initial penetration is is more frequent and uh, there's just less less pressure, um, uh, like basically less resistance, I should say, from the initial point of the, of attack defender. Um, so I think that's that kind of adds overall over time, and then you know just. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. You start to question like, okay, this can't be really our base identity. Like, you know, like we don't have the personnel for this. Like if you had a high level rim protector, maybe you could get away with that because they can close plays easier. And just like, there's more like, like resistance for, you know, paint pressure from the other team. Like, like I talked to a couple of players that play against the Mavs, like, you know, kind of after the all-star break. And they were just, you know, kind of alluding to the fact that there was no interior presence. Like that's hard to, to funnel people off the line into personnel that where you don't have an interior presence. Like the yeah. uh, opponent, like what, like sometimes it's like in practice, if you catch someone by surprise by not having, you know, like what, whatever you would call that interior presence and you get a stop, that's great. But if the opponent kind of feels emboldened where they have that confidence where they're like, like, like they can't stop me. Like that's kind of an extra, that's kind of extra layer, uh, you know, to your attack. Like you're, you're going in a certain kind of way, uh, you know, off the dribble uh, and stuff like that. Um, you know, I think that all kind of ties into it. And I think they just need like, uh, like, you know, the kind of difference making talent, like, uh, you know, whether it's one or two players where you can kind of, you know, be the calling card of the defense and, you know, kind of form an identity around, um, and then have a more sustainable style, like just running off the line over and over again and funneling. I think that ended up becoming something they switched away from more kind of in March. I think they, they pressed a lot of buttons like, oh, we're going to go big. OK, we're going to go super small now. Like there was times where there was like four shooting guards, if you really want to like kind of <laughs> boil it down. Like and then you don't have a, like a true rim protector at the five. Like that's that like if you're trying that many things that in the stretch run of a season that like you're basically put it, pushing all kinds of buttons and you're not getting the the result that you uh that you need so i think uh that just comes down like you know some coaching can be you know complain about like as we said earlier with like kind of what went into the season but like at the end of the day 
there definitely needs to be like personnel changes for you to kind of have an identity that like truly works and you can like rely on throughout a season. As you were kind of discussing that, it made me think about a team that's currently in the playoffs right now that seemed to find that identity. And I'm talking about the Lakers and what they were able to do at the trade deadline, getting the Jared Vanderbilts of the world and some of these guys like D'Angelo Russell and Achimura to pair with, you know, Reeves and LeBron and AD. And you've seen the fortunes of them defensively turn completely around. When you look at the Mavericks, do they need to get younger, more athletic, obviously a lot longer and rangier? Will that help them maybe create some of that identity? A lot of the ways that the Lakers are able to do on the fly during the course of their season. Yeah, I definitely think that could help. I think if you are going to kind of play that, uh, you know, flying around the half court style, um, that they did like to play, you know, during the conference finals run. I think you definitely need someone that's got a lot of, uh, like, uh, you know, stamina, uh, you know, someone that's willing to do those extra rotations um, to, that that you basically take, like, you know, some of the burden off of the superstar. Like, like someone who's going to basically be like, all right, like, would it be ideal for all five players to fly around and, like, you know, be, like, you know, really quick and locked in? Yes. But I know that I have to do more than mm-hmm. say the superstar. Like I think that's what went into last year. They had that stamina, they had that effectiveness, and um, but I think also what kind of ties into it is just at sometimes when you have a large enough sample size, other teams just figure out what you're doing as well. Like that, that I think um, like youth uh, speed uh, enhances what what they could do, but then you kind of need that uh, like that anchor. Um, you know, those kind of like foundational pieces, um, that kind of just have that talent, like genuinely difference making talent, um, that kind of set the tone. Like, um, when I covered the, the Pacers in the past, uh, with Miles Turner and Thaddeus Young, um, and Victor Oladipo, they finished like third, uh, second or third defensive rating, uh, in the whole season. And that's because like, despite having like, uh, you know, Darren Collison and Boyan Bogdanovich at the one and the three. They just had the four and the five that can just cover things up like crazy. Victor mm. Oladipo, he wasn't the the the, the most like uh, phenomenal at like containing drives, but he flew around uh, with his athleticism and his explosiveness. Like like um, like he was all defense that season. Like you you can get away with having some players um, that aren't going to be the most like impactful if you have those kind of like foundational talents that have that ability um, to kind of set the tone um, and kind of, you know, be a foundational piece. And I just don't think the Mavs, you know, even last year, I don't think they had any of those pieces. Like Dorian was probably the closest to that because of how versatile he was. But I don't think you would ever necessarily say like he is like a top like three or four or five in this particular attribute or trait. Like he's very, very good. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's like, you know, like, like for the Lakers, Anthony Davis is a complete monster as a rim protector. <laughs> you know, yeah. like like he 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 can do all kinds of stuff. He's elite at a lot of things. Vanderbilt is very 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 good. You know, you could say elite and and things as well. And then they have like that, like as we talked about, like that speed. Like Dennis Schroeder, like you know, you're not going to always be successful against Steph Curry, but at least they have that speed to kind of you know at least like you know get around a screen and just like you know keep up with him, have that closing speed. There's like the Mavs when they play Steph Curry, like Reggie Bullock did his best, but you, there's no, there's no like, clo- <laughs> like, like you, there's a difference between Reggie Bullock uh, and Finney Smith's closing speed and like a Dennis Schroeder's closing speed. So it's like, like things like that. Like there's, there's certain physical limitations. There's also like, there's just talent aspect of it too. Like they just like, like, you know, offense is very important to have those kinds of talents. Like, I think if you think of it that way, like, Luca is that kind of like transcendent talent you have that your offense like kind of starts with um, same with Kyrie, but who um, is the equivalent of that on your defense? Like, like you kind of need uh, those types of talents to kind of be the, the table setter, if you will. Speaking of some of those foundational talents, I think one of the things that was most pleasantly surprising for Mavs fans this season, Josh green was able to develop a little bit of a three point shot, still some inconsistencies with that at times, but I think the biggest bright spot of all, and I'm sure you could speak to it, having watched and covered this team throughout the year, Jaden Hardy seems like a young man who is going to continue to get better. And I think one thing, Grant, that I loved about his game the most is that the fearlessness at which he plays the game with, my man is not afraid of a shot, not afraid to take it to the basket and to try to make things happen. 
he's obviously still has to grow into his game and grow into what he's capable of. But what did you see from him that should give Mavs fans encouragement that this could be a guy going into the next couple of years that really is going to continue to grow and progress in his game? Yeah, I think the big thing is, um, you know, when you kind of enter the, you know, the NBA level, um, there's there's got to be some like humility or, you know, unselfishness that kind of goes into it. And, um, you know, with him, uh, with Hardy, you know, he was willing to play off the ball and attack closeouts and like catch and shoot and do all those types of things and just go in with an open mind. I think that is a very like good indicator of like kind of him growing into his game, as you said. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, you know, as he kind of goes along, um, you know, one of the areas that even in summer league, I felt like um, that kind of stood out as a need to improve was kind of just like the reads he's making out of like high ball screens. Um, you know, like there, it's a it's something that I've kind of noticed with a lot of rookies when you kind of just like think about how they're playing the game, like n- not to, to make another like like Pacers comparison. It's pure coincidence. But Benedict Matherin is another player that I think, you know, people like he had the opportunity to have the stats to be like a rookie of the year candidate. Uh, but I think um what a lot of people kind of like, if you, if you go underneath the surface and kind of look at how he like produced, um, he was really effective in like off ball actions. Like, you know, you, you, you turn the corner, you use your natural talent and you're, you know, you, you might make a read, um, but it's not like a, like a layered like read where it's like a high ball screen where you got to read the low man who's responsible for that weak side corner. And like, you know, there, there's a lot less um, like kind of like, like, I guess you could say like chess element to it. Um, and, you know, attacking closeouts, running in transition, like all that stuff, that's, um, that kind of were areas he excelled at, but making those kind of challenging reads, he did not excel at, but he had those minutes, um, to put up the production. And I feel like offensively, Jaden Hardy, uh, was, is kind of in a similar, like, like space, if you will. And that's like a common thing for young players. So I think, um, you know, like kind of going into summer league, if he does end up participating as he uh, said, he will. Um, just seeing how he like kind of shows growth in that area and like, uh, you know, building off of the end of the season that he had, I think will be uh, interesting to monitor and will be important going in next season, especially like, you know, not to go too far into it, but like if you have a backcourt, ideally of Luca and Kyrie, you want that third guard that can create, and, you know, be effective, especially when there, there will be times when one of those guys misses games. Um, so that like being able to make those reads is, is, is essential, especially, uh, you know, with the way the roster is kind of constructed right now. As we start to finish up here, I'm interested in your perspective on this because as we were mentioning a little bit earlier, May 16th is coming around the corner. And of course, that's the draft lottery night. The Dallas Mavericks, if that pick falls outside the top 10, will need to send it to Jalen Brunson and company in New York. If you're the Mavericks and you do keep that pick, it's number 10 or better. And let's say it's not number one overall, because if it's number one, we know what you're doing, taking Victor Wimbanyama. But let's say it's anything that's not involving taking Victor. Are you keeping that pick and making the pick there? Or are you trying to package it maybe with a Tim Hardaway Jr. and trying to find someone to take not only his descending contract, but a top five, top 10 pick in order to find an established veteran that can really help you right now versus maybe having to wait on a prospect to be able to turn the corner for you? I think I definitely would like evaluate the trade kind of market and, and just see what's out there. I think uh, I would also at the very least just kind of buy time with it. Um, I wouldn't make a deal like super far out from the draft um, mostly because you can kind of see who's a riser, who's a faller, especially like, you know, the lottery taking place at the start of the, the, you know, NBA combine, um, you know, just gaining some Intel um, and seeing like, sometimes like some guys will unexpectedly fall and you don't want to like trade it out of it. And then like, Oh man, like we had that guy on a rookie contract. Like we could have really had something there, but like um, sometimes there's, there's players that just rise and like, you know, especially wings um, you know, like if, if someone does rise and you wanted to fill a wing spot um, and all of them kind of like kind of gravitated outside of your pick and the, you know, the, the, the boards and like your Intel says, then, you know, you might want to just trade it. But then again, you kind of have to find that balancing act of like, what does the rest of the league think with, with like kind of where players are trending? Would they be interested in trading for that pick if, you know, now these players may be out of range? So I think there's like a lot of like complicated layers that kind of go into like, like the timing of the trade, let alone like, what is the value of this pick? Um, And then it also goes into like, who are you trading it with? Like, as you said, like Tim Hardaway, 
that's probably the best bet, um, especially if you want to uh, address with the like the wing spot. Um, you know, if you uh, are were to attach to like a Davis Breton, um, uh, do you want me to restart uh, this part? <laughs> Look, making an appearance as well. No, it's good. No, it's good. Okay, yeah, yeah, because my dog's going a little crazy. Um, but yeah, like if you were if you were to attach to like a Davis Breton, that would be challenging to get like great value out of the pick. Um, because you know, like he still has time on his deal. Like I know, I know the final year, there's like quite a bit of non-guarantee element to it, but, um, you know, like there's, there's limitations in trade value with him. Um, but if you do with, with Tim Hardaway, I think, um, you know, that's about like 17, uh, I think around like 17, uh, ish million dollars, um, that could salary match quite a bit. Um, you know, uh, that, that's something that you could definitely, um, you know, maybe try to find like a guy like like if you want a rim protector, uh, maybe like a Miles Turner type or, you know, something like that. Like if, if he's available and, um, you know, finding wings is tough because um, you'd have to really like kind of find a team that I feel like, like if you're in contender mode, you don't want to give up your wings. Um, so then you kind of have to go into like who's available on a rebuilding team, potentially what would be worth trading the, the 10th pick uh, for if, you know, assuming that's like kind of where the range is. And who would want to also take on that salary? I think that's kind of where it would trend towards a rebuilding team uh, because those teams are more willing to take on those salaries. Uh, it's so easy to find like those kind of like shooting guard, uh, like volume shooter types that like, I think a contender would probably like more so pass on uh, like a Tim Hardaway. Um, like unless they're like really in a, in a bind, like, uh, like Cleveland, you know, was a team that was floated mid season mm-hmm. um, as potentially having interest. And, you know, when you go to the playoffs, like, they are they were in a really tough spot. Like, Isaac Okoro still hasn't developed a three. Uh, Osman was, you know, a guy they were closing with, and he was getting picked on um, on the switches. But if you're Cleveland, like, do you think Tim Hardaway will stack up better on those switches when you're closing games? Like, you, like probably not. So it's like that's where you become reluctant to take, like, uh, that type of trade if you're Cleveland because you got to win with Donovan Mitchell's timeline. So I think just in general, like, just finding, like, probably, like, like a, a wing or a rim protector that's on that rebuilding team uh, would probably make the most sense, but you don't want to give up too much value uh, with the 10th pick. But, you know, when you look at their overall trade assets, that's where it gets complicated with how gridlocked like the next few years are. Cause then, you know, ideally you wouldn't want to give up the top 10 pick in the shoe mm-hmm. strap. Um, but when you only have a 2027 that you can utilize in that scenario and all your seconds are cleaned out for seven years, that's where the trade situation gets a little complicated and you start to be like, okay, well, what if I put in maybe like a Josh green or something instead? Mm-hmm. Um, so that like, there's a lot of different uh, like little layers. I feel like that'll be interesting to see how they kind of evaluate it as they kind of get closer to the draft for sure. Yeah. The path forward is a difficult one for the Mavericks to traverse given the resources and assets that they are trying to utilize in order to make this happen to keep Luka Doncic happy, which is, of course, is the name of the game for this franchise. Last question for you. I said it a little bit earlier, but I kind of want to explore it just a little bit more because you obviously had a chance to go on the road with this team a lot more, especially during the second half of the year. And in a lot of ways, Grant, you became kind of the people's champ for the MFFLs and Mavs fans out there with the viral videos and the questions and the things that you were doing, how did you grow as a reporter and as someone who covers this team and seeing the kind of effect, not just your coverage was having, but obviously the tremendous response to it, given what you were able to do this past season and wanted to do more going forward for covering this team. Yeah. I think the the big thing was I, I haven't really like done uh, like the consistent, like, you know, like day to day in person, uh, like kind of coverage of a team because of the coronavirus, like restrictions and all. Um, like, you, cause you remember, like, when, when we were at the, like, the few games I went to, we were up top, like, uh, mm-hmm. like that Clippers Mavs uh, playoff game. Like, you know, you can't really go to a press conference and ask uh-huh. a question and gain that experience if, like, you're up top and, like, everything's blocked off and there's no enough fans, like, even in the building. <laughs> Or, well, I guess there were at that time, but like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just like, mm-hmm. it's just a weird environment. Like, it's not even like a real setup. Like, unless you wave your hand on Zoom and you know what you're doing, <laughs> you know, you're probably, you're probably going to be boxed out of that one. So like, um, you know, I, I uh, definitely like kind of went into it with the idea of like kind of challenging myself 
Um, like I want to like, you know, like I don't want to leave with nothing. Like I want to, when I go into this game or this practice, I, I have an idea of what I want to ask. And I also like, I'm going to, you know, challenge myself to, to get it done. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, especially with Luca um, early in the season when he was playing so well, you know, it's challenging to kind of get those, those questions off um, at times, you know, cause everyone's interested in asking him a question, you know, especially when he's playing so well and like, you know, other people outside of like that regular, like Dallas, um, you know, kind of like reporter uh, group, if you will, um, are there to ask questions as well. So like I, I, uh, you know, got, got some interesting things uh, from him kind of focusing on like, you know, getting like those basketball insights. Like I remember uh, like I wasn't posting them at that time. Like I kind of figured out what I was doing as I went throughout the season but like, you know, something that I, like, I thought was really cool was like, he told me about like, or like the answer, like a couple of years ago, someone told me I couldn't take those, those two point shots, like the, the pull up twos. And then like, people were like, wait, who was it? Like, like they started like, <laughs> guessing like, like who it was and like, you know, like, oh, wow. Like you really weren't, weren't allowed to do that. Okay. Uh, like, you know, like, little insights like that are kind of interesting. Like as a guy's like scoring 30 for like nine straight games and all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, and it's kind of interesting too, because you kind of learn like, as you go, like, like how challenging is it like within like a shorter period on the, on a road game, you know, who kind of is enthusiastic still and Mm -hmm. unenthusiastic after a loss, who wants to kind of just get out of there, you know, all that (laughs) kind of stuff. Like, like you kind of learn a lot uh, when you're doing it that way and then know like, you know, like, okay, I can expect to get this and I want to write this story um about this topic and you know it'll probably take this amount of games and you know this practice like hope hopefully this guy's gonna talk like that all that stuff like it's cool to like kind of like learn that all so then like next year when i kind of get get into it i'll know like wow i actually know what a training camp looks like Uh, actually yeah like like it's a little different when you have no idea uh you're like oh this is the door i go through to to go to training camp like stuff like that like like now now no and it's like comfortable and all that stuff and yeah, I'll be curious to see, um, you know, kind of like, like what, what, what I can basically do with stories and all that stuff, like going into next season, uh, for sure. Well, your work was tremendous this past season covering this team. While, yes, the on the floor product wasn't necessarily what we all thought it was going to be. The coverage around this team was second to none. And obviously a lot of Mavs fans appreciate the work that you have done and continue to do going forward here for this team. Grant, tell the folks where they can find you and what you got going on as we uh, get ready to go into this important summer for the Mavs. Yeah, for sure. All my writing, uh, for the most part, is on uh, DallasBasketball.com. Uh, you can find me on uh, social media um, for my first and last names, my uh, username, how, how few people have my last name, uh, Grant <laughs> Afseth, A-F-S-E-T-H on pretty much everything. Um, yeah, so I think I'll, uh, I'll be doing a lot of like, um, you know, like, kind of focuses on like uh, X's and O's on like player development stuff. Like, you know, what, what a player did well, what they could improve, like, especially starting with the young players like Josh Green, Jaden Hardy, and then looking at some draft prospects and trade targets. And then, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, working to get out to, you know, like summer league and like analyze um, like the games as they go on. And then, uh, you know, I also have a, a video uh, from Luca's um, international games, um, like with Slovenia. So I'll do like breakdowns on that. Cause I know like people, it's kind of awkward. Like if you, if you're working and they're like playing at like, like during your work day and it's like, right, scary, right. Like, like, like maybe not the most legal way of watching the, uh, the <laughs> game too. Uh, so, you know, I feel like, you know, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, put together like some breakdowns of like his play and all that stuff uh, with Slovenia for sure too. So there'll, there'll be a lot of stuff uh, like, you know, like kind of as the summer kind of gets going uh after that uh or around that combine period for sure well i appreciate you taking the time for joining me on the podcast today this was a lot of fun and look to hope to do it again soon grant really appreciate it yeah thanks for having me i appreciate it hello it is ryan and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day couldn't we just to make up for things like sitting in traffic doing the dishes counting your steps you know all the mundane stuff that is why i'm such a big fan of chumba casino chumba casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime anywhere with daily bonuses that should brighten your day a little actually a lot so sign up now at chumbacasino.com 
That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. BTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on ChumbaCasino.com. I looked over the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino-style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's ChumbaCasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. VTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.